Members and guests of the Red Society, it's my great privilege to introduce Mark. say is, George, you don't owe me any money anymore. <laughs> uh, but thank you very much. You know, as I was as I was listening to the last lecture and looking it up and seeing so many friends and colleagues, I realized that I actually had the remarkable privilege of practicing uh, with both of these men, uh, Ray Margario, George and Mike, of course, and Don Guest. They were my partners in the practice of medicine, and so it's kind of an ironic coincidence, I suppose that uh, I'm up here this morning and I hope I can share some information, hopefully some new information, I'll leave it to you to decide, uh, about the use of gene therapy techniques uh, for macular degeneration, the evolve the evolution. And it's interesting, it was 35 years ago this year that I, I uh, went to Arvo for the first time for a Palmer and I presented uh, that work on 5-4-year or still another added metabolites and it was the beginning of a lifelong a passion uh, for not just pharmacology, but for retinal pharmacology and helping to put it together as a, a field that really wasn't a, a field when I was a resident on top of steroids and intravitreal drug injections. I want to acknowledge, when you present, I'll try to present a fair amount of data to you today, I'll try to go quickly enough to get it done and slowly enough to be able to impart some uh, information from it, but you don't do this alone. Yeah, many, many people that really made remarkable contributions uh, to this. Many of you are here today. Uh, and I want to thank everybody uh, for their work. Um, in the way of disclosures, uh, George has already done all my disclosures. I guess I don't have to do them. But, uh, I'll just put them up here for you. This is something I believe in, actually, and I, I put it before you proudly as a way to put forward and advance science for the benefit of humanity, not just science for science's sake alone. Um, finally, uh, because some of the work was done in conjunction with a publicly traded company I put before you uh, required a disclosure about forward-looking statements, uh, which you can all read and so forth. Uh, Don Gass was a great friend to me, a great friend to many people here, and to multiple generations of retinal specialists, both at Aspen Palmer and around the world. I don't think most people would say he was the father of macular diseases. Uh, I'd like to show this photograph here on your, on your left, which is uh, Don on the right, and then the uh, person in the center is Vic Curtin, and the person on the left is Ed Norton. These were his great fans, and these were the people that put Baston Palmer on the map and made it one of the great institutions. <clears throat> At this time, I would say Don, amongst all, sort of uh, foremost amongst equals, was really somebody who everyone looked up to, including uh, Vic and, and Ed. There's a picture of me with Don. When I started at Baston Palmer, Don had such a prolific uh, repository of fundus images and uh, histopathology that uh, they gave him an extra half of an office. He had one office, and then he had another half of an office that connected up, and that's where he stored everything. And so when a young guy from Stanford came there and, and was asked to do one of the faculty, they said, well, we don't have a lot of space, but you can have the other half of Don's <laughs> office. And so that's what I took. And Charlie Barr knows this because he used to visit me when he was the chief resident there. And I got to know Don because of that proximity. And he trained me. And I wrote my first papers for which in Palmer with Don. We got to describe a number of diseases, acute renal necrosis, and uh, lymphoproliferative pigment epithelium, semi solid pigment epithelial detachments, and serpiginous, and so on. And Don was somebody who was actually very much uh, an extraordinary part of my life. And it's, aside from just uh, acknowledging his greatness, as a leader, he was a great friend and mentor. For those of you that didn't know Don, he was born in 1928. He graduated from Vanderbilt. Um, and he moved to Baskin Palmer when Norton was recruiting a cast of the most exceptional people in the world to form the Eye Institute. And he published the Stereoscopic Atlas of Macular Diseases, which remains the Bible of macular diseases. And he described more than 20 or 30 important diseases, AMP, serpiginous choroiditis, multiple choroiditis, acute necrosis, it goes on and on and on. And then he not only described their appearance, but he also did the histology as an ocular pathologist. And he trained most of the, many, I shouldn't say most, but many of the most important uh, retinal specialists of our time. And he 
finally moved back to his native Nashville in 1995 and sadly developed pancreatic carcinoma and passed away in 2005. So he's been gone 10 years, but his memory lives on and he is one of the, the true greats of all of American medicine, let alone uh, macular diseases. With that, um, I'll try to lay out for you what I hope to accomplish this morning, aside from honoring Don, and that is to show you the, the rationale for gene therapy. I'll tell you about some things that you may be familiar with and some things you might not be familiar with. I'll try to cover the basic principles of gene therapy, the specific uh, challenges of gene therapy for retinal diseases, the results of early preclinical studies, the initial results of human trials, and then I'll tell you a little bit of a mystery and how I think we used translation on what I'll share with you this morning is how we address the mystery um, and used basic methods of translational science experimentalism to be able to answer that mystery and then finally to use those same sorts of methods to maybe point a way forward in the future. So it's kind of near and dear to my heart because I think it really speaks to the value of translational science and its role in promoting um, clinical medicine. Now the rationale for gene therapy and macular degeneration is very straightforward. It's a chronic disease, it responds well to a protein therapeutic, but the treatment burden is high. I won't go into the numbers of injections that are required and so forth, but we know that uh, gene therapy has now been successfully employed for another disease, a much less common disease, but nonetheless a very serious disease in which if you can, if you can express a protein by transfecting cells to produce it inside the eye, you don't need to inject it. And that's a seminal work by Alan Wire and Gene Bennett, and Al was actually one of my trainees. And so there's a direct link to Don Gas as well. Um, and what I pose to you is a question, a provocative question for you to all think about is, is there the prospect for safe and effective, one and done, gene therapy and macular generation using clinically accepted methods? That would be a worthwhile goal if it was safe and it was effective. And let's, let's see if we can try to answer that. Now the basics of gene therapy are very straightforward. We use cDNA uh, to encode a therapeutic protein of interest. You don't inject the protein, you inject the DNA. You stick it inside a vector. Uh, usually it's viral, it doesn't have to be. And you can choose any number of different viruses. And then these vectors, of course, have to be safe. So they're typically replication deficient. They can't cause viral disease. And we replace their own DNA essentially the Trojan horse, with the DNA that we want them to produce. And, uh, and that's pretty straightforward. And there are a number of uh, viruses that have been used over the years. Adenovirus, adeno-associated virus, herpes viruses, retroviruses, lentiviruses, vaccinoviruses, and they all have strengths and they all have weaknesses. Some can accommodate larger amounts of DNA, some less. Some can integrate it to the genome, some don't. But you would pick and choose depending upon what your indication was. Now, uh, probably the most commonly used virus is one called AAV, adeno-associated virus. Now, uh, mind you, this is not adenovirus, this is an adeno-associated virus. It's a smaller virus. It's not pathogenic. It's single-stranded DNA. It's not double-stranded. It's a very small uh, genome, uh, about uh, 4.7 kilobases. So it doesn't take in very large amounts of DNA for very large proteins, and then it needs, other, it needs help. It's, it's really it's basically composed of two components. Uh, one is wrap and one is cap. The cap is what codes for the protein that encompasses the virus, and then the cap and then the rep are some of the instructions that cause a cell to cause those proteins to replicate. And then there are some promoters and some other small units of DNA that also drive its production. Now it turns out that what you do is you pull out the rep and you pull out the cap and you replace them with the transgene. The transgene is the DNA for the protein that you're trying to produce. And there's a promoter that basically is the instruction set that tells the cell, uh, which has been uh, infected by this or transfected by the virus, uh, to produce that. And then you do that, and that cell becomes an unwitting accomplice uh, in, the disease, in treating the disease by producing a protein other than what it might otherwise choose to produce, assuming it has all the replicate machinery inside it, mitochondria, and so forth. Now it turns out in the eye, this isn't quite as straightforward as it might seem because the internal limiting membrane, it turns out to be a barrier. So if you put AAV and other viruses in the vitreous cavity, uh, they'll, they'll travel around, but they have a hard time, at least in humans, not in rodents necessarily, getting across the ILM. And so they, have, they can't make it into the retina with a high degree of efficiency. 
And, uh, and so it, while it works, it doesn't work as well as we'd like, at least using the currently available viruses, A82, and some, even some of the other uh, viruses that are available. Now, if you re, uh, remove the ILM, you can uh, get the viruses moving, but that involves a surgical procedure. Uh, and so what most people have done up to this point in time is they've, they've uh, injected uh, the AAV encoding the appropriate amount of cDNA for whatever protein you want to produce underneath the retina. It involves a surgery. It's not a big complicated surgery, but it's a surgery that requires a vitrectomy. If you do that, you can see on the right that, that that's green fluorescent protein that's being produced and expressed by the retinal pigment epithelium under the retina, whereas if you gave the AAV in the center of the vitreous cavity on the left, that's the expression that you see. Now, the question comes up, what proteins do you want to use? There are a number of naturally occurring, there's also a number of manufactured anti-VEGF proteins that we're aware of. There is a naturally occurring anti-VEGF protein that we all have. It's called a soluble flit, and it is the extracellular domain of the VEGF R1 receptor. Uh, and if you chop it off at the cell membrane and, and you don't link it to the tyrosine kinase, it can be used as a drug. It has six domains, protein loops. Uh, the second loop, it turns out, is the one that does most of the binding. Uh, the other loops add something. The third loop actually has some special qualities I'll get back to in a moment that, uh, that, that uh, creates some issues for it as well. But it, it has very high affinity, 10 picomolar affinity. It's a little more, has somewhat greater affinity than uh, at least native rat doesn't have a little less affinity than native of flibercept. So it's a powerful anti-angiogenic protein, at least in vitro. And uh, this work was pioneered by uh, Ian Constable and Rosh Kirkosi and uh, the Lions Eye Institute. And they showed that if you uh, use gene therapy techniques with AEB2 and soluble flit as the cDNA, that you can basically completely inhibit the development of laser-induced neovascularization in primates, not just in small animals, but in uh, new world primates. And this led to their initiating a trial to do this with gene therapy. And there was a second trial that was done with a similar variation on a theme of soluble flint in which it was injected intravitreally um, and attached to a uh, FC fragment to, to form a fusion protein. I won't tell you much about that trial, uh, but I will tell you a, a little bit about the trial that was done by uh, uh, Constable and colleagues in, in, uh, in Australia. And this is the design that was done. Some of this was well publicized. Probably many of you are familiar with this work in which the patients received, patients who had chronic use, need for uh, repeated intravitreal injections, they were not treatment naive for the most part, they received an injection of ranibizumab, then they had gene therapy, and then they had a second injection of ranibizumab, and then uh, the investigators waited, and, uh, and they waited to see whether they needed further injections, and if they did, it suggested the drug wasn't work, that it wasn't working, if they didn't, it suggested maybe the protein was being created, and the initial results uh, were quite good. This is an ex I just want to show you uh, a video of the way this was administered because it has some bearing on the results. And you can see here Dr. Constable is using a flexible uh, uh, catheter to uh, penetrate the retina and then to inject soluble flit uh, transgene in an AAP2 vector under the retina. You can see it spreading out and moving towards the macula, although it wasn't put under the center of the macula, but you can see it's a very extensive lesion. It came right up to the edge. And that's the way it was done in the study. You can just advance this slide for me. And here's an OCT taken two hours after that injection. I don't know if it was that patient or another. And you can see that the, that the uh, uh, fluid actually makes its way into the center of the macula, even though it wasn't injected there, presumably through gravity or diffusion. And then within 24 hours, the retina is flat again. And uh, here, are the, uh, here are the results. The results were very encouraging. Of the six patients who received intravitreal, excuse me, subretinal um, soluble flip transgene, uh, there was a dramatic reduction in the amount of fluid uh, beneath the center of the fovea, both, and there was an improvement in the visual acuity. You can see the OCT reduction here. And you can see the uh, visual acuity improved about eight letters in two different uh, doses. Uh, and based upon those favorable phase one study results, a larger phase two A study was done with the same indications. The only difference was that the patients had much better uh, starting visual acuity because there was greater comfort 
uh, they had, instead of 36 letters, they had 63 letters, and they also had much more normal maculas. OCT thickness on average, 330 microns versus 540 microns. And these trial results, while showing some suggestion of biologic effect, were certainly not overwhelming, and they were a little disappointing, candidly, in terms of our expectations and hopes to see the same sort of <coughs> effect that we'd seen in the first uh, uh, trial in phase one. And we looked at this a uh, whole bunch of different ways, and we saw some suggestion that more patients saw better and fewer patients had severe loss of vision. But it certainly wasn't overwhelming, and it didn't really create a, a great uh, sense that we should advance fur further with this for a phase three study. And so we had, we stepped back a little bit. This is the mystery part. We said, what happened? What did we do? How do we understand this? And so we tried to figure out a, through a, through traditional translational scientific techniques, we decided to explore, go back into preclinical models and look at the location of the subretinal rejection, whether it was extrafolic or subfolic, and also the dose. And we used an animal model, and you can see here we were questioning whether or not the fluid bleb was moving into the center of the macula, and that's why it worked well, or whether the drug was just moving itself, uh, even if the bleb wasn't moving. These are just some examples, and these were just hypotheses that we were dealing with at that time. And here's another way of looking at it. Does the drug spread from where it's injected, or does it stick? Again, we didn't know the answer, but we set out to answer that question. And so you can see here we used an animal model. These are African green monkeys. This is a well-described experimental model. It's highly predictive of most of the results that have occurred in humans, and so it, in a sense, it, I, I take this seriously with regard to its predictive value um, for what's likely or not to work in humans. And we found that when we, uh, we tried two different techniques, one, we put the bleb outside the macula. You can see that on the left there. It was superior extrafoveal bleb. The other was a foveal bleb. And the, these were done by highly experienced people, both retinal surgeons and also animal veterinary ophthalmologists. And they found that in trying to create subfolio blebs, some of these animals developed small macular holes. And this is work by Zillar and Kiss here that showed that when we replicated this again, there was a significant proportion of the animals, if you try to actually create a bleb in a normal attached macula, uh, where this may lead to the development of macular hole. And we know this can occur from uh, working patients, although typically it's not as much of a problem if the macula is already detached. And these are OCTs, the primates that Zillar did showing the development, acute development, of a macular hole after subfoveal injection. So this represented a bit of a challenge, and it said, well, perhaps that's not a viable clinical procedure uh, to inject beneath the center of the folio uh, in, for this particular indication when the macula is otherwise fairly normal. And so what we did is we then used an angiographic grading system to evaluate whether or not these animals, after a laser challenge, developed unequivocal neovascularization. It's pretty straightforward. You can see the results there. Here we found that on average, if you, uh, if you place approximately 100 spots, high intensity, short duration spots in the macula or around the macula, about 30 to 35 percent of those animals will develop unequivocal florid neovascularization. A smaller number may actually develop lesser degrees of neovascularization, but we might argue about whether that's true neovascularization or not. And you can see here that if you, uh, when we went back and used the same drug that was used in the humans, and we put it away from the center of the fovea, and that's the middle column of the superior extrafoveal bleb, you can see that there was only a modest reduction in the amount of neovascularization. However, if you put it directly under the center of the fovea, there was virtually complete neovascularization inhibition. And so it spoke to the issue of pharmacokinetics the importance not only of the transgene, but how you administer and where you put it. Uh, so we felt that we obtained definitive answers in this non-human uh, primate model informing the interpretation of our clinical results. What they did is they confirmed the efficacy of AAV2 soluble flip when administered subfoveally, but not very well when it's extrafoveal. Uh, and we wondered why that might have been in the phase one study and not in the phase two study. And when we went back and looked at the entry criteria, we realized that most of the patients in the phase one study had very extensive fluid under the macula. 
um, is based on the OCT envision, and that probably created, at least this is an ex one possible explanation, and they have created um, the ability for the drug to move into the macula, whereas in lesser involved eyes didn't make its way there. So then we went back and said, well, what can we do uh, going forward to try to solve that problem without having to necessarily inject uh, beneath the center of the phobia? And so we looked at some second generation vectors, different variations on AEV, and we looked at alternative cDNA for other anti vegf proteins, and then we looked at where, do you, where can you put this that's safer and easier. Now, an intravitreal approach to gene therapy would be very attractive because it doesn't require surgery. You don't have the issues of cataract, anesthesia, <laughs> and so forth. Uh, but it's not that easy to do. I showed you that, that these, uh, at least the naturally occurring vectors, don't make their way through the retina very well. And so and these are just some examples of other naturally occurring variations of AAP2, some of which may work a little better or a little worse than AAP2. But for the most part, they don't make their way across very well. Well, it turns out that there's a technique in science called directed evolution. It's used to develop novel proteins, but you can also use it to develop novel uh, uh, gene therapy products as well, in which you basically mutate drugs that work pretty well, and then you basically screen them against libraries, and you find the ones that seem to work better, and then you mutate those, and you do it over again, and over and over again, and essentially you compress evolution into a matter of weeks and months rather than millions of years. And then you base the choice of those molecules on how they bind in a variety of uh, things. And you can also do other things for gene therapy in addition to changing uh, the protein coat, uh, which affects the transmission through the internal limiting membrane. You can also change the promoter and change some of the other expression aspects. So this is what, it, what happens. This is work that's been done in a number of laboratories. And it turns out that if you use a standard AAD serotype on the left, you don't get much penetration into the retinal layers. If you use what's called a directed variant, an evolved variant, it transfects the retina very nicely after intravitreal injection. If you modify the promoter, you can actually specify not only that the drug or the vector gets into the retina, but that it affects some cells primarily, let's say retinal ganglion cells or photoreceptors, and not Mueller cells or other cells. This shows you here with an ubiquitous uh, Promoter on the left, you transfect all cells, whereas with a you know with a promoter that's directed at photoreceptors, you only actually transfect the photoreceptors on the right. So we used the directed these products of directed evolution, the modified vectors, and alternative cDNA that is for other anti-VEGF proteins, not just cyclofled, and we injected these into monkeys, and then we did the laser model again. This just shows you that these vectors were very well tolerated. There was a minimal amount of inflammation in around like week six, but by week eight, it was completely resolved and it did not require any treatment. And that's important because you can induce an immune response with some AAV vectors. So you want these to be uh, vectors that don't induce immunity. And then we looked at for toxic, potential toxic effects. And these, these vectors were extremely well tolerated in the eye. You can see here, autofluorescence, infrared, and OCT examinations. So we didn't see any signs of toxicity, macular edema, or any other problems at all when they were administered in these animals. And then we, we went back and we did the model again just to be sure that there was consistency in the control group from model to model. And these are just the examples here of the neovascularization rates being between 25 and 35 percent. So here's the, here's the uh, part that I'm uh, most interested in telling you about, which is that if you take a second generation vector and you put it uh, underneath the uh, uh, retina, uh, it turns out you can achieve better inhibition uh, with uh, uh, novel vectors, which is the far right, that's the AUVM022, than you can with the soluble flip that we showed you, which is in the middle there and then the control. Importantly, when we use an intravitreal rather than a subretinal injection technique with the same second generation vector expressing anti-VEGF protein 1, it completely inhibited grade 4 choroidal neovascularization as seen on the right, whereas that same second generation vector expressing 
soluble flit had essentially no effect when given intravitreally. We took a second intravitreal, a second anti-VEGF protein with a completely different chemical structure than the first one. These are commercially available agents, and with the novel vector, it also produced a complete inhibition of neovascularization. It was comparable to putting that protein itself, that's the middle column, 0% completely comparable to putting the intravitreal protein in itself, except that it was expressed for 20 to 26 weeks at least, and we're following these animals now, and we presume that this will probably be secreted for many more months or years. So, uh, finally, uh, how do we know it works and why should it work? Well, if you measure the protein levels uh, for these after administration of these vectors, you get relatively high levels of expression both in the retina and in the vitreous cavity. So these are my conclusion slides. Looking back, surveying the past, we've been able to obtain definitive answers in a preclinical model informing the interpretation of somewhat discordant phase one and phase two results. Uh, in other words, we confirmed the efficacy of soluble flood AAV2 if injected under the center of the phobia, but in reduced capacity. And that disappointment, if you will, created an opportunity, it created the opportunity to go and to look harder and better for molecules that, that had more potential to be used in perhaps safer and easier ways. So that surveying the future created a path forward. It appears to me, at least I believe, that gene therapy appears to have promise in the treatment of AMD. I can't promise that it will be one and done, but the possibility exists with more work. And with optimized vectors and expression cassettes and optimal anti-VEGF, anti-VEGF CDNA, these preclinical pre studies in primates demonstrate excellent efficacy and suggest that an intravitreal rod of administration, in other words, doing this in the office, is feasible and certainly desirable if you can do it. Uh, the results are comparable in preclinical studies to whether or not we had injected one of several different potent anti-VEGF proteins themselves, not the cDNA, and actually superior to, not only in, in terms of uh, potential uh, off-target effects, but also superior in efficacy to the surgical subretinal administration gene therapy vectors. So finally, I would say caveats always exist. I want to be very careful to caution everyone that these are still early results. They need to be reconfirmed to be repeated and they need to be expanded upon um, and, they, and we will do that and others will do that as well and we need to particularly look at the durability and further pharmacokinetic studies that are very encouraging uh, to be sure that the expressions are sufficiently of long duration that this does in fact represent a true meaningful advance in terms of the burden and I would say going a step beyond the burden I think there's hope that it may even produce uh, improved efficacy over time. So I'll stop at that point. I want to thank you all for the privilege of receiving the GAS Award. I want to thank you for taking the time to listen, and uh, it's been a great pleasure to be with you this morning. Mark, that was an absolutely brilliant lecture tonight. It's very, very exciting work. I really appreciate your uh, articulate explanation of it. I actually fall under than understood it, which is, uh, which is rare for these kinds of things. Just absolutely brilliant. <laughs>